So my name is Stuart Russell. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and director of the Center for Human Compatible AI. Um, I've been at Berkeley for 31 years uh, doing AI research. Uh, before that, I did my PhD at Stanford and my undergraduate degree in physics at Oxford. So um, a long time ago, uh, you know, when Alan Turing was introducing the idea of what became artificial intelligence, um, he pointed out that if we succeeded, uh, we would eventually have machines that were more intelligent than humans. Uh, and uh, he was quite pessimistic about what that meant. Um, and he said, you know, at best we might at strategic moments be able to switch off the power and even so our species would be humbled. Um, and uh, you could call that the gorilla problem because the gorilla's ancestors at some point uh, decided to make humans. Humans were much more intelligent than the gorillas and the gorillas uh, probably regret it uh, from their own point of view. Uh, and, but that's a rather formless problem. It's just a sort of general sense that if you make something more in intelligent than you are, uh, you might not uh, be very happy about the results. But it's not clear why. And if you look from the other side of the, the general progress of artificial intelligence, we generally assume that making the machines more intelligent is good. Um, so you've got this clash of intuitions. Um, and I, I think the most likely reason why we should be concerned is that uh, when you have machines that are very intelligent but have objectives that are different from uh, the ones that we actually prefer to see achieved, then you have a problem. Uh, it's a little bit like a chess match. You have an objective that's different from the person who's trying to beat you. Um, and we can't afford to have a chess match with the stakes being the whole world, um, when, particularly a chess match that we would lose. So we need to figure out how to solve this problem, something called the value alignment problem. Uh, how do we get the machine's objectives to be perfectly aligned with those of humans? Uh, and you could call this a King Midas problem. Right? Rather than a gorilla problem, the King Midas problem. King Midas, his problem was he asked for everything um, he touched to turn to gold, and he got exactly what he said. Uh, and then his food and his drink and his relatives turned to gold and he was very unhappy and died of starvation and, and misery. So um, that's the problem, right? It's very hard to say, to state your objectives correctly, particularly when you've got a super intelligent machine that will come up with ways of achieving your objectives that never occurred to you in the first place. Um, so Nick Bostrom, in his book Superintelligence, has the example of the paperclip machine. You know, you think you're giving it the harmless obje objective of sitting in the corner and making paperclips, um, and before long it's turned the entire planet Earth into a sea of paperclips and is working on the rest of the universe. Uh, and when you look at that from a human point of view, if a human being did that, if you asked a human being to make some paperclips and they turned the whole planet into paperclips, you would say they must have something wrong with them, right? They're clearly stupid. Um, you know, even if they developed you know, amazing engineering and physics to, to achieve this feat, uh, you would say they're completely idiotic because they had failed to understand the basics of what humans want. Um, and, and we humans learn that growing up just as a matter of course, just like we learn that up is up and down is down, and if you drop a bottle of milk, it spills, and all, all the other things we learn about the, the so-called physics of the world, but we learn the objective structure of our species and our society at the same time. Uh, I don't even think we really distinguish it uh, as, a, as a different type of knowledge, it's just that's part of being a common sense, capable human. Um, and unfortunately, we have really no idea how to do that part. Um, we've, we've paid very little attention to it. And one of the reasons for that is we have, uh, we've applied AI in extremely restricted contexts. Um, so, for example, AlphaGo 
plays moves on the Go board, it has the objective of winning the Go game. But you know, if the house was burning down in the middle of a game, AlphaGo would just continue making moves on the Go board because that's its world. Uh, so the objective makes sense in that very small world, even if it doesn't make sense in the larger world. And, and AI has only paid attention to these small, restricted subworlds. But when we get into the real world, right? When, for example, we have uh, stock trading algorithms, uh, you know, they have effects in the real world, and they have crashed the economy for short periods. Um, imagine a personal assistant that that has your credit card. Uh, and something it doesn't quite understand, that it, and it empties out your bank account buying video games for one of your kids, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you can see how things could get out of hand very easily. Um, so my goal is the, to try to figure out a solution to this problem. Yeah, so, um, so Steve Omohundro pointed out that uh, along with misalignment, which causes the system to sort of do the wrong thing from your point of view, um, it, pretty much any objective you put in, even something as simple as fetching the coffee, uh, generates as a sub-goal uh, protecting yourself from interference. Um, because, of course, if someone switches you off, you're not going to be able to fetch the coffee. Um, and so if there's a possibility of being switched off, it's rational to take preemptive action to prevent that. Uh, so you might disable the off switch or, or actually preemptively attack uh, potential switcher offers uh, who would get in the way of you getting the coffee. Um, and you could say, well, all right, you know, let's, um, let's make the goal more complex. It's not fetch the coffee. It's fetch the coffee while not disabling the off switch and not touching any other people. Um, but then, you know, there are other ways of preventing yourself from being switched off, like, you know, electrifying the off switch so you haven't disabled it, but if anyone touches it, they'll die, um, and so on and so forth, or you're putting a piranha-filled moat around the off switch. So it's actually, uh, it, it's no easier to, to write constraints on behavior to prevent these bad things than it is to write uh, tax law to prevent people from cheating on their taxes. Uh, you know, it, when they have more highly paid lawyers than you do, they are smarter, they will find a way to avoid taxes uh, that strictly complies with the law, but nonetheless ends up without paying any taxes. So, um, so I think the idea that we are going to be able to write specifications and constraints on behavior that guarantee um, that we're going to be happy with the results, I think that's, uh, that approach is hopeless. Um, it doesn't hurt to put some constraints on if there are things you know you don't want to have happen, you can put them on, but it's not going to, you're never going to ensure that none of the bad things happen. Um, so uh, how, do we, how do we get around this, right? So if, if any objective is put into a machine, then it's going to want to disable its off switch uh, and want to prevent you from interfering. Uh, and that's undesirable. Um, and I think the only solution is to design it in such a way that it wants to be switched off if that's appropriate. Um, and so one solution, there may be others, but one solution we came up with is that um, you design the machine uh, following two simple principles. The first one is that uh, its only objective is to maximize the realization of your reward function, of your objective. But we have to think of that objective not as something that is put into the machine, but as a latent variable, right? something that's not directly observed. It exists in the human's head, but can't be accessed, so to speak. Um, and therefore, the machine, the second principle is the machine has to be explicitly uncertain about what that objective is. Uh, so for example, it may know that you want, to fetch, want it to fetch the coffee, but it may not know the value that you attach to the well-being of other customers in Starbucks. So the right way for it to behave is not to change the state of the other customers in Starbucks. Uh, because that way, whether you like them or, or don't like them, you're not going to change that, the value of that portion of the objective function. Um, so this, uh, this type of uncertainty about the objective uh, gives the machine an incentive to allow itself to be switched off because 
you're only going to switch it off if, if, you, if, uh, if the robot starts to do something that makes you unhappy. And the robot knows it doesn't want you to be unhappy. It doesn't know what it's about to do that is going to make you unhappy, but it knows that it doesn't want to make you unhappy. So it would prefer to be switched off than do anything uh, to violate your objectives because it doesn't know what they are. If it thinks that it knows what they are, what, what your objectives are, then it won't believe that it could do anything that would make you unhappy. Uh, and so it has then an incentive to disable the off switch. Right? But when it's uncertain about the objective, it works the other way. Uh, being switched off is a benefit to the robot because it has a benefit to the human or it prevents harm to the human. So that's the, um, that's the basic idea. And then the the other part of the solution is um, if the robot starts out uncertain about the objective, how does it learn more? Um, because it's not going to be particularly useful uh, if it's clueless about most of the human objective, the prefer human preference structure. Um, and one answer to that problem is to allow machines uh, to observe human behavior and to interpret that behavior as providing evidence of an underlying preference structure about what people want. Um, and this is uh, a field called inverse reinforcement learning. Um, and that's the, the inverse of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning means learning how to behave uh, by being given reward and punishment signals. Uh, this is the opposite. It's re you observe the behavior and you try to figure out what is the underlying reward or punishment signal that's being optimized. Uh, so inverse reinforcement learning is a technique for observing behavior and inferring the underlying preference structure of, of the person who's behaving. Um, and we have algorithms that work fairly well and there have been plenty of demonstrations. The field is about 20 years old now. Um, there are a couple of wrinkles uh, on uh, the applicability of inverse reinforcement learning to solve this problem. So one is that um, in the standard theory of inverse reinforcement learning we assume that the behavior we're observing is rational, i.e. that it does in fact optimize the reward. But of course humans are not rational, so uh, they behave in ways that may not in fact optimize their reward. For example, um, Gary Kasparov uh, playing against Deep Blue um, may have played a number of extremely good moves, but at some point he played a move that lost the game. Now, at that point, did he want to lose the game? No, but he did the action that did lose the game. Uh, why did he do that? Because he's not rational, because he has computational limitations that prevented him from seeing that that move would lose. So we have to interpret human behavior in the light of, of our understanding of actual human cognitive capabilities uh, and biases and the, the real architecture of human cognition. Uh, and that's difficult because we don't understand it very well. Um, so that's one of the wrinkles that we have to deal with. Um, the other wrinkle is, is a, a good wrinkle, um, which is that um, in standard inverse reinforcement learning, the idea is that the robot is sort of watching the human, as it were, through a two-way mirror. And um, the human is just doing their optimal thing uh, as if there was nothing else in the world. And so it's a, we're observing an agent in a single agent decision problem making decisions. But in fact, the human and the robot are both in the environment. And it's in the human's interest to act in such a way that the robot learns more quickly. So imagine a surgeon teaching a junior doctor how to perform a particular operation. They're not going to do that particular surgery just as they always do when no one's watching. Right? They're going to show the junior doctor, okay, now look, here's what I'm doing next. Now here's what happens if I do it too deep, or uh, you know, here's why I don't do this, uh, and so on. Right? So they'll demonstrate, they'll slow down, they'll, they'll break the whole process down into its pieces and explain each one, they'll do lots of things to help the other human learn. And a human will do the same thing for the robot. Um, they'll act in ways that make their preferences more clear so that the robot catches on uh, more easily and quickly and can be more helpful. 
Um, so that's a, a good wrinkle. It means that um, rather than solving single agent decision problems and single agent inverse reinforcement learning problems, we have to solve multi agent reinforcement learning problems, which are more complex and involve game theory. Um, and in fact, as soon as you get to two humans in a robot, you even have strategic interactions that the humans have an incentive not to reveal their true preferences because uh, if they act more helpless, they'll get more of the robot's services, so to speak. So these are interesting issues that, that come up um, and there's no way around them, we have to solve them. Uh, well, that's, that's the $64 million question. Uh, and this is, this is a question that's been studied by political and moral philosophers for millennia um, because we can't make everyone maximally happy. We can't make everyone king or queen of the universe. Um, and uh, one simple answer is uh, we have to aggregate preferences and try to optimize the uh, preferences in aggregate. Um, you know, put simply, you kind of add up the degree of happiness of each person that you can achieve and you try to maximize the sum of that. Um, and it, that sounds very simple-minded, but it has the property of, of symmetry, we're treating each person equally. Um, there are some difficult issues that come up about uh, whether the preference scales uh, of different people are commensurable. Um, uh, for example, if one person just feels a lot more strongly uh, about the, you know, the quality of their airline seat than another person, does that mean they should get the big seat and the other person should get the small seat? Um, just because they, they have a, a more stretched out utility scale? Um, it's not clear. Uh, but these are, I would say, good problems to have. Um, because in solving them, we'll actually, I think, make progress on, on fundamental questions of fairness. Um, but they don't invalidate the overall approach, because whatever algorithm you put into a robot, it's going to have some effect on the preferences of all the people in the world. And you want to make it such that uh, whatever that aggregate effect is, it's, it's the best you can obtain. Um, so then it's just a question of, of getting more detail on what you mean by best for, for aggregate preferences. Um, so so there's that, that's one issue. Uh, there's another wrinkle uh, having to do with people whose preferences include the suffering of others. Um, so if one person is only happy when other people are suffering, does that mean we need to at least make other people suffer a bit so that that person isn't too unhappy? Uh, that's an interesting question, <laughs> um, and I, I feel that the right answer is that those types of preferences shouldn't count. That any jollies you get from the suffering of others should be, should be weighed, uh, given zero weight in the overall calculation. Um, another little wrinkle is um, what you might call the, the Somalia problem, that you, know, you, you come home tired after a long day's work and the lawn needs mowing and you ask your domestic robot to mow the lawn and the robot says, you know, I've just learned that there are humans in Somalia who are suffering a lot more than you and so I'm going off to Somalia to help them because uh, that'll have a better effect on the aggregate utility of the world than mowing your lawn. Um, and uh, I mean, in some sense, you'd be very proud of a robot that did that, just as you might be proud of your, you know, your teenage children if they did that. Um, but, uh, of course, you might not buy a robot that, <laughs> that did that. Um, so what is, what's the answer there? And I think that's an interesting little technical problem to solve, and I, I think it has something to do with the robot uh, owing you some obligation beyond the obligation that it owes to humanity in general, and that extra obligation has to do with how much you paid for it. Uh, I think something like that should work out, but uh, you know, it's 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 good to have these kinds of problems because they, they, we're going to have to figure them out one way or another. Robots have to respect the preferences not just of their owner but um, of everybody else, because otherwise, a robot that belongs to a callous owner who doesn't care about anyone else's well-being 
uh, will behave in ways that cause a lot of negative outcomes uh, for other humans. Yeah, I think uh, I, I've written an article called uh, Moral Philosophy Will Be a Key Industry Sector. Uh, and I think, I think uh, it will. Because robots will have to operate in the moral sphere. They will be taking actions which, if a human was doing them, we would have to, the human would have to be making moral judgments about how to do them right. Um, and uh, uh, unless we solve that, um, we're going to see robots doing things that post-hoc we think are extremely immoral or, or disturbing. Um, and that could actually set back the field. N nobody wants a, a robot in their house that sometimes does something that we would normally think of as psychopathic. So there's a very strong economic incentive for the industry to actually solve this problem. It's very common in the media to confuse the killer robot question with the existential risk question because both of them involve Terminator robot pictures. Uh, and so the, the, I think people get confused, naturally. Um, so uh, clearly, uh, no one is going to build weapons um, that have sufficient general intelligence to, for example, decide on and execute a plan to take over the world. Um, they'll build weapons with relatively simple AI. Um, you know, think of it as a combination of you know, AlphaGo and the self-driving car software um, that can carry, carry out uh, specified missions um, and then come back to base and stop. You know, so in that sense, they're no more scary than, than a chess program. Of course, they're scary, and of course, they can, they can and will kill people. Um, and I think of that as not so much a, a pr problem of, of uh, an intrinsic risk from AI, but a, a risk from the misuse of AI. Uh, and it's really um, humans deciding to use that type of weapon uh, in the wrong way. I mean, it, all other things being equal, uh, an AI weapon could be beneficial uh, if it's carrying out the same mission as, as a much less sophisticated weapon. Uh, for example, uh, a 2,000 pound bomb. Um, if you want to kill a particular terrorist who's hiding out uh, in, in a block of flats, a 2,000 pound bomb will do it, but it will, it's too stupid and it will you know, kill another 48 civilians. Whereas uh, an AI system could fly inside the building, find the terrorist and kill them. But um, this, this kind of uh, all other things being equal assumption uh, is completely wrong, right? You know, spears and cruise missiles could be used in the same circumstances to carry out the same missions, right? If you wanted to fly a cruise missile for 30 yards to kill someone who's in front of you. But they're not because they have other capabilities. Cruise missiles can do things that spears can't, and so we use them in different ways. And as soon as we have autonomous weapons, we will start using them uh, in different ways, for example, as weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we'll take uh, you know, small, uh, lethal flying devices uh, and pack them by the million into uh, some kind of transport system and release them over cities and wipe out whole populations. Uh, and that seems like a very bad idea from the point of view of international security. So that's my primary reason for opposing the use of AI and lethal weapons. Um, the employment issue, um, again, you could argue that it, it could be a misuse of AI, uh, in this case, to replace uh, gainful employment of humans with machines. Um, and in the economic logic of today's society, that's entirely justifiable thing to do. If you are producing some good or service and you can do it cheaper by using machine, then it's, that's entirely uh, appropriate according to current thinking. Um, but if you apply that thinking over and over and over again uh, and you don't adjust the rest of our society, the laws, the economy, structure, the education system, uh, and so on, uh, you can have a catastrophic effect uh, on levels of employment and employability of, of people. 
So that's a problem that we have to figure out solutions for. Um, now, whether work on making AI beneficial of understanding human preferences and aligning themselves with human preferences, um, possibly in the long run that may help with uh, this employment issue. Uh, in the following rather abstract way, um, it's, 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 if you think about um, a distant future where uh, you know the machines can sort of do everything, um, one one version of that future is that humans are just pampered uh, and become effete uh, and enfeebled, uh, and there are many science fiction stories where that happens. So, Wall-E, the movie, uh, that's exactly what happens to to the. the grossly overweight uh, and useless human beings on board the, the starship. So um, what should a good robot do in that circumstance? Well, it should understand that autonomy and capability are part of the human preference structure, not just you know, ease and consumption and hedonism. Uh, and so it should actually refuse to do some things that humans might ask it, ask it to do. Because, of course, humans may be too short-sighted to realize that by continually asking for things to be done for them, they will eventually become uh, enfeebled and spoiled and, and useless. And, and in the end, you know, at the end of their lives, look back and say, this was terrible. You know, I, my life was really a complete waste. I achieved nothing by myself and I learned nothing. Uh, but of course, you know, before the fact, you may not anticipate that that's how you're going to feel. Uh, but machines, presumably, uh, with, the, with the aid of philosophers and, uh, and so on, can help us to understand that storyline uh, and avoid it by actually giving people more uh, leeway to, to solve their own problems and sometimes fail. Because, of course, you know, if, if, if you can never fail, then in some sense you can never succeed. Uh, because the, the whole notion of success has within it the possibility of failure. And uh, I think that's, that's a, that's a long-term and very qualitative issue for human society, but I think you know, uh, stories like E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops point out the importance that it's the slow boiling frog phenomenon. We, we gradually uh, accept more and more help from the machines uh, until we become helpless. So I think the reason that people come up with these arguments not to pay attention, uh, the reason is primarily defensiveness. I think people feel threatened by an argument that says that continued research on improving the capabilities of AI could have negative consequences. Um, and when you look at examples of how they try to refute the importance of, of solving these problems, um, they'll say things like, well, there's really no risk because we can always just switch it off. You know, you'll see well-known, very brilliant AI researchers saying things like that. Right? But of course, you know, a super intelligent AI system would figure that out that someone might switch it off. Uh, so it's sort of like saying, well, you know, beating AlphaGo is, is no problem. You just play better moves, right? <laughs> Clearly, um, something is going on beyond, you know, rational consideration of the issues here because, you know, intelligent people should not be making arguments as simple-minded as that. Um, another one that I saw was, uh, you know, the concession that, yes, it's theoretically possible that superintelligent AI systems uh, could uh, present an existential risk, but it's also theoretically possible that a black hole could materialize in near-Earth orbit and present an existential risk. But we don't spend any time worrying about that, so why should we spend any time worrying about superintelligent AI? Okay, well, look at that argument, right? If if two-thirds of the world's physicists were working on causing a black hole to materialize in near-Earth orbit, and no one was asking whether that was a good idea or whether it would be safe if it actually happened, uh, there would be something seriously wrong, right? Of course we would want to make sure 
that they had done a very thorough safety analysis before making black holes uh, appear in near Earth orbit. Um, so, so again, you have to you have to wonder what is going on, and I think it's just a kind of a uh, a defensive uh, psychological reaction to uh, to feeling that somehow you're under attack or that your research might be constrained or prescribed. Um, and uh, you know, I, th I think it's just, there's, it's the wrong mental picture altogether. That it's there's the AI and, and anyone who says these things is anti-AI, right? Any more than someone who points out that um, it's a good idea to contain uh, a nuclear chain reaction is anti-physics, right? Of course they're not anti-physics. In fact, most nuclear physicists or nuclear engineers work on containing nuclear reactions. That's what they do. Uh, because uncontained nuclear reactions are not useful, they're called thermonuclear weapons. Um, so, uh, so we should think that way. This is not anti-AI. This is actually ensuring that uh, AI can proceed in a beneficial direction. The idea that um, the word bridge contains within it the notion that it shouldn't fall down, uh, and, and we don't have to add that extra description every time we talk about bridges. Uh, and this is just what civil engineers do. They build bridges and of course they mean bridges that don't fall down. We want to build AI systems. We shouldn't have to say AI systems that don't do things that make us extremely unhappy. Um, because it w you know, that wouldn't be a good AI system. But the thing is, right, with, this, with the standard definition of AI, uh, it's perfectly consistent to have a good AI system that does things that makes us extremely unhappy, if that's intrinsic to the objective that we put in it. Right? And then it's sort of our fault for putting the wrong objective in, not the AI system's fault. But that's a really bad design philosophy, right? That we, we, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, making uh, an object that's extremely dangerous uh, unless used exactly perfectly, right? That's not a good design, right? So really, we want part of the responsibility for good behavior to lie with the machine itself. You get what you code or what you design, not necessarily what you want. <laughs> Uh, yes, unless, unless you design it the right way, where you can show that it's provably beneficial, that you, you're guaranteed to get what you want, because the thing that you've designed, its job is to figure out what you want uh, and make sure that you get it. In AI and machine learning, uh, we always have to allow for the possibility that, um, for example, in, in, in learning, to recognize, uh, you know, Dalmatians, uh, you might get a series of examples of Dalmatians that are extremely abnormal, right? You know, all the photographs of the Dalmatians just happen to show the bottom of his left foot uh, and nothing else, right? And if that's the case, you you're not you can't prove that the system will will learn to recognize Dalmatians correctly because the data can sometimes with small probability be extremely unrepresentative. So when we talk about uh, provably correct machine learning, uh, there's always, it's provable with respect to some small probability of having some deviation from learning the correct function. So this is sometimes called probably approximately correct learning. Um, so any system that interacts with the real world uh, what we mean by provably correct or design is always subject to these uh, caveats that there is some possibility that it will deviate. Um, but you try to push that possibility down to you know, 10 to the minus 75 or whatever by, by making the system more conservative uh, in, its, in its design. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think it's a correct observation that the the, the community of people who were concerned about AI risk were not especially successful uh, in convincing the mainstream AI community that this was a, a core problem that had to be addressed. Um, and part of the reason is the, the mindset of the traditional AI community, 
uh, which, which very quickly turns defensive as soon as you start talking about these things. Um, but I think part of it is that uh, if you're not an AI researcher, it's hard to talk in the right language. And I think a lot of the language and descriptions um, were viewing AGI as, as if um, the control problem was the following. An AGI arrives from another galaxy on the Earth. Make sure that you can control it. Right? And if that's the problem, there is no solution. Right? And, it, and it's not something the AI community is going to engage with because it doesn't make sense to them. Right? Clearly, the AGI is going to be something that we build. Now, it might be that we build AI by processes of, of black box genetic programming, uh, you know, deep learning, randomized network evolution kind of stuff where we really have the faintest idea how it works. Um, and uh, you know, I don't actually believe those approaches would work, but if they did, then yeah, we would have no idea how to control such a system because uh, we don't know what it we don't know what it does or how it's built. Um, but I think you know when you when you uh, talk to AI researchers in language that they understand, for example, about the difficulties of specifying goals correctly. Um, about these uh, instrumental goal arguments of Steve Omohandro, they those are perfectly clear and straightforward, and, and they'll even start telling you stories about how their reinforcement learning agent, you know, started behaving strangely because they didn't specify the reward function correctly, and, and so on. And then, you know, I think it, if it's done in a way that uh, engages uh, them in solving the problem rather than accusing them of evil, uh, it will work better. You know, all these discussions are, are necessarily oversimplified because uh, the actual systems people build will mostly be designed for particular purposes and they'll gradually uh, add and integrate more capabilities. You know, we'll integrate the ability to understand language with the ability to understand video so that we can have the systems watch TV and, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, in, in solving those integration problems, we will push the level of generality so that it starts to cover more and more kinds of problems. Um, and systems will exceed human capabilities along some dimensions by vast margins while still being completely inept. So just like you know, AlphaGo and, and Deep Blue are extreme versions of that because those are the only things they do, uh, are Go and chess. Um, but uh, you know, you can have systems that are very good at understanding language but can't plan their way out of a paper bag. You know, they're not going to present an existential risk. But then someone else is building something that's extremely good at long-range planning. Um, and then you can couple that with something that can read everything the world has ever written. Uh, so now you've got a much greater knowledge base which the long-range planning system can use to, to really create plans that manipulate the world on a global scale. Now, now things start to look more interesting. So. Um, I think you really got to look at components and dimensions of capabilities and not think of it as machine IQ that is you know, creeping along 75, 80, 85, right? There's no such thing as machine IQ and uh, it's not a one-dimensional explosion uh, that's going to happen. I think that's a really interesting question uh, because arguably we could get many of the benefits by building multiple narrow systems. You know, a system that helps us do amazing scientific research but doesn't understand anything about world politics or human behavior. <coughs> that seems perfectly fine and, and achievable and um, you know, vice versa. You know, a system that could advise us on political and economic decisions but can't do scientific research at all and, and so on. Um, and so it might be that what we should think about doing is, is creating general purpose AI capability, but as it were, not deploying it in that form, but then sort of specializing it <coughs> to particular, <coughs> excuse me, uh, specializing it to particular tasks uh, before deploying, so that uh, presumably that would be a way of mitigating risk. Um, it's, you know, general purpose AI is ex an extremely attractive thing. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's been the holy grail and, you know, if you had to say, you know, what would it be worth? 
hundreds of trillions of dollars, right? Multiples of, of the GDP of the world because it would completely transform everything, right? Uh, you know, if, if you want to create some, you know, let, let's say that search engines didn't exist, you know, and search engines are worth about a trillion dollars, right? Well, the way we created that was to do a whole lot of research and engineering and, and build multiple companies that compete with each other, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of engineers and developing uh, the search engine industry as it is today. If you had a general purpose AI system, you would just say, oh, could you build me a search engine? That would be it. Done. <laughs> right? Uh, so you, you can use it to create a trillion dollar thing, you know, with no effort whatsoever. So it's, it's clearly of enormous value uh, in, in what it can do for the human race, uh, as, but only if we solve the control problem.